Hello everyone, my name is Alvaro Lozano Robledo and this is a video about the ELF functions and modular forms database also known as LMFDB. Uh, this video is a is part of a series of videos on computations in number theory research which is a mini course that I'm offering as part of the Connecticut Summer School in Number Theory 2020 CTNT 2020 which is over completely online this year. Um, before I start, uh, during the video I will show a number of websites and the links to those websites are in the description of the video below so you can click on those and explore the websites yourself as you go along if you want to uh, learn more. Alright, so let's get started with the uh, LMFDB, lmfdb.org. In uh, the database uh, forms a collection of data on uh, a number of objects of number theory interest and it builds on previous uh, databases, so there used to be uh, number fields databases by Jones and Roberts, uh, for example, the, uh, the well-known Cremona database on elliptic curve data, the Stein and Watkins database on elliptic curves, the Stein database on modular forms, and what LMFDB does is put everything under a very convenient roof, uh, one common roof, and also to uh, in a place where we can interconnect this data because we know there are very interesting connections between these objects. And also uh, the database is built in a new way that um, they are putting a lot of emphasis and effort in the accuracy and the, um, the completeness of the data that is being put into uh, these database. By the way, before I go on, there is a video on uh, the Simons website uh, by John Voigt, one of the editorial uh, members of the, of the database, where he explains, well, the motivation to uh, build such a database and uh, more of the technical inerts of, um, of the database. So I would, I would suggest that you watch this video also by, uh, by John Voigt, um, where there is a lot of very important information about the database. Here I'm just doing, I'm going to do an overview, uh, a virtual tour of the database itself. Okay, so um, one thing perhaps I should start with is uh, show you that at the bottom you can actually see the editorial board. So you can see that the managing editors of the database are John Carmona, John Jones, Andrew Sutherland, and John Voigt, and then, uh, and then a number of other associate editors that are also behind uh, this database. You can also go to uh, acknowledgements and under acknowledgements you can find uh, the number of sponsors that without them uh, this database could, in, could not exist, the American Institute of Mathematics, NSF, and a number of institutions and private uh, funding sources that have contributed funds for the database and for the upkeep of the data. Uh, there is a number of meetings about the database, uh, the work on the database, and then there is a lot of contributors that have contributed data or code or uh, knowledge to the database in terms of theorems about um, uh, computational aspects of the database. So you can see uh, a long list of people that have contributed. All right, very good. So let's go back to the, uh, to the home and uh, talk a little bit more about what's in the database. Uh, so the database uh, collects data about um, different types of objects, uh, some uh, analytic objects such as the functions, modular forms, geometric objects such as uh, varieties, uh, elliptic curves over Q number fields, uh, higher genus, uh, families of elliptic curves about uh, other algebraic objects such as number fields, and uh, other just group theoretic objects and representation theory objects such as Dirichlet characters, Artin uh, representations, and then Galois groups and Sadotate groups. Um, why, why this collection of objects? If you go to this link, it gives you a very nice overview of how these objects are, are uh, conjecturally connected through the Langlands program. Uh, and if you hover over each one of these labels, then you can read uh, what they are and what kind of examples are in these, uh, in these corners. And then also what kind of things connect one world with the other. Okay, um, so um, this is worth exploring for a while. This is a very neat diagram. All right, let's go back to home and start looking at some of these objects. So uh, let me start with uh, number fields. So if you start with number fields, uh, by the way, uh, the database is not just a collection of data, it is also a knowledge base 
um, data. Uh, th so there is a, also a, a knowledge base uh, to the database in terms of uh, descriptions that you can uh, th you can access by clicking on anything that is underlined like that. It's clickable, and then you get a nice description of what this object is. So, for example, a global number field. If you don't know what that is, you can see uh, what it is in that little diagram. And uh, then you can search for uh, number fields using a number of parameters to uh, search for fields with different uh, invariants. Or you can go by label, by nickname or polynomial. Uh, so for example, if you just want to find uh, your beloved uh, rational numbers, that's just Q, and then you get information about Q. Let's look at a number field that is not just Q, some actual extension. So Q adjoin I or Q adjoin I works, and that brings you to uh, the field that is the extension of adjoining the square root of minus one. So here is the extension. Or if you know more about it, you can actually access via its label, uh, which uh, the labels are very interesting in the database, how to uh, parameterize and how to label uniquely each element of the database. So for example, for uh, number fields, if I want to describe the, um, the Gaussian, in, the Gaussian um, rational numbers, Q at join I, uh, those will be uh, given by a four uh, four parameters for the label, the degree, the real signature, the absolute value of the discriminant, and the index of how many such number fields there might be with the same signature and absolute value of the discriminant. So for Q adjoin I, that would be degree two, and uh, there are zero uh, embeddings into the real numbers, so I get a zero here. The absolute value of the discriminant that is four, the discriminant is minus four, so the absolute is four. And then there might be more with the same signature and absolute value. In this case, there's only one. So 2.0.4.1 is uh, Q at join I. Once you are in the um, screen for one number field, it gives you a number of invariants of the number field. If you don't know which one, uh, what those invariants are, of course, then you can click on, uh, on those and it tells you the definition, for example, of root discriminant. Uh, it also gives you some important information. For example, it tells you that this uh, field is Galois and a billion over Q, and it tells you a little bit more about um, uh, about its uh, all sorts of information about the class group, the unit group, and etc. Let me go to some other example where the unit group. The, so, by the way, oh, one one nice thing is that. For each number field, it gives you an integral basis of the ring of integers in terms of a basis of um, of of the of the field. So, if this is the defining polynomial of the field, a root of that is called a, and out of that root, it gives you generators. So, in this case, one and i generate over the integers, the ring of integers of the of Q join i, and uh, then the unit group would be the group of units of the ring of integers and in this case the rank is zero so uh, there is only torsion uh, so the the units there's only four units in the group of units all right so let's let's go to some other number field uh, that has some uh, more units so for example i can go by a defining polynomial to define a cubic field and if I go to this cubic field, then now I see that this field is not Galois over Q, and um, it still gives me an integral basis of the ring of integers. And in this case, the unit group is infinite, so the rank is 1. There is still some torsion, and it gives me a fundamental unit, in this case, a root of this polynomial. By the way, notice that it gave me a slightly better polynomial to define the same number of field, and a root of that polynomial is a fundamental unit for my uh, unit group. So it's a generator of the uh, unit's modulo torsion. It gives me the Galois group. I'll talk a little bit more about Galois groups. What that means is that, well, this field was not Galois, but they are, this gives me the uh, Galois structure of the algebraic closure of my field. So it's an S3. Um, the, the Galois closure is S3. Okay. 
um, it gives me if there are intermediate fields and some sibling fields in this case it gives me the closure and it gives me the label of the Galois closure of my number field and some other more refined uh, information for example gives me art in representation information so if you don't know what an art in representation is it gives me what um, type of continuous homomorphisms are there um, attached to this number field okay all right. So um, while we are talking about talking about uh, Galois groups, let's go to Galois groups, and then uh, you can search for Galois groups. By the way, what is a, a Galois group in this sense? Um, so the Galois group of an irreducible polynomial of degree n is some uh, transitive subgroup in S n. So if you want to look by degree, this means a Galois groups that are realized with polynomials of those degrees. So for example, uh, let's look again for S3. So when appears S3 as a Galois group, it can appear as 3T2, meaning um, a number field. Uh, it's loading. Um, so here it is. So it is a Galois group that appears in degree 3, so as a Galois group of a cubic. Uh, polynomial, so if that would be the closure of that polynomial, or S3 can also appear as a um, as a polynomial of degree 6, so the Galois group of a polynomial of degree 6, which is what we saw in the example before, this was done with a cubic, and its Galois closure was S3. Okay, um, or the, the, the Galois group of the closure is S3. All right, so um, let's go now to, uh, let's go back to Galois groups. I just wanted to show you that there is uh, more realizations. For example, if I go to A5, there is other realizations that A5 appears as a, the five here is the degree of the polynomial where it's realized. So A5 can appear as a, a polynomial, as a Galois group of a quintic, but it also can also appear as a Galois group of a sextic polynomial. All right. Um, there is also art, more art in representation information. Um, I'm not going to go into those, uh, but let me jump to uh, other type of representations, which are the Dirichlet characters. What is uh, a Dirichlet character? A Dirichlet character is a function from the integers to the complex numbers, and it comes with a modulus, uh, so that the function is completely multiplicative, and, um, and then there is the issue of whether characters are primitive, if its conductor is usual is equal equal to its modulus, so uh, let's just look for a couple of uh, characters. Uh, let's see what um, what kind of characters we can get modulo four. Uh, so let's look for those. And there's two types of characters modulo four. Uh, one is uh, one is even, one is odd, one is primitive, the other one is not. The parity, by the way, is what happens with the value of minus one if it's uh, minus one, it's odd. If it's uh, one, it's even. And the primitivity means that uh, this is essentially that this character is new modulo four, while this character is not new modulo four. It came from, um, it rises from a uh, character in a lower modulus that divides four. In this case, this is a trivial character, and that's why it's not new uh, modulo four. It comes from conductor one. All right, so let's look at this character, and you can get the information about the character. The character, in uh, in terms of a Kronecker symbol, if you don't know what a Kronecker symbol is, a Kronecker symbol is an extension of the Jacobi symbol, which in turn is an extension of the Legendre symbol. And uh, this character is simply evaluating the Kronecker uh, minus four over an integer gives you a value, and that's the value of the character. Okay, so out of Dirichlet characters we can build L functions. So let's uh, jump to L functions over here and uh, the L functions, there are, L, there are L functions up to degree 4 in the database and um, well the most famous L function of all of course is the Riemann uh, set of function and the Riemann set of function is just um, so let me let me go back to what is a Dirichlet series. A Dirichlet series is a formal uh, series of this form, where the coefficients a n 
are in the complex numbers and when they all the ans are ones that's the Riemann set of function which is this with a bunch of terms expressed in here and uh, such Dirichlet series they satisfy a functional equation so this is the uh, this other function is the completion of the the of the set of the set of function and the completion satisfies a uh, a functional equation between s and 1 minus s and then you get all sorts of other information about the uh, set of function such as its Euler product some particular value a special value of the uh, of the set of function that gives me a value at a half which is uh, a critical point for uh, for the zeta function and then a few of the zeros of course uh, the Riemann hypothesis tells me that all the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function are on the critical line and the line s uh, the real part of s equals a half and uh, this is a graph of the Riemann zeta function and the line uh, real part of s equals a half there's a lot of more information about the Riemann zeta function so if you go actually to let's go back here um, to here and, and the Riemann zeros you can actually uh, download data about the zeros the first uh, this is just the first hundred zeros but there is actually uh, a lot more uh, by the way uh, in most of the pages I think in all of the pages you can learn more about how this data was gathered uh, so you can click on completeness of the data and it tells you how many zeros are there a ton of zeros it tells you what the source of the data is so uh, who computed the data and how um, the data was computed and uh, you can also learn about the reliability of the data again the uh, editors of the database um, pride themselves on the um, the reliability and the accuracy of the data that is being computed and, and shared with other mathematicians. All right, let's go back to L functions. Um, so if I look by uh, degree, degree one, those are the Dirichlet L functions. So again, what is now a Dirichlet L function? It's an L function where you have the coefficients are given by a Dirichlet character. So if I have a Dirichlet character, then I have a, uh, a Dirichlet L function. By the way, the degree of uh, an L function is um, the number of, essentially the number of gamma factors that you have to put in to get the completed L function. But there is a, a, a real gamma, complex gamma, uh, give you a different uh, number. So anyway, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll click on that in a moment. Um, but in any case, these are degree one L functions, and uh, you can find more information about them um, by click on on one of them that are in the database. Remember, so these are uh, these represent uh, different dots or different uh, characters on the L function attached to them. So remember, we looked at a, a Dirichlet character modulo four that uh, there was a primitive one, and that was odd. So if it is odd, then it is a green dot. So uh, let's look at it here. That's modulo four and um, green. So that is the character we looked at before gives this a function and it has this functional equation and it gives you all sorts of other information about the L function, such as its Euler product. This is the Euler product that is attached to a Dirichlet character. By the way, something that will be important is the analytic rank. Uh, the analytic rank is the order of vanishing at its central point. Uh, so if this uh, function uh, has a central line at s equals half, uh, or a real part of s equals a half, uh, that's the symmetry, then the central point will be s equals a half. And then we are interested in the value of the L function at a half. And that's the its value, that's its uh, uh, special value and we're also interested if there is vanishing if the vanishing is zero then how uh, what's the multiplicity of the vanishing in this case uh, the rank is zero meaning there is no vanishing that will be important in the world of elliptic curves in particular okay so um, yep so let's uh, let's move on to uh, some varieties so let me talk about elliptic curves so uh, elliptic curves, um, 
um, what, what is an elliptic curve? You can click on elliptic curves here and it will give you uh, an explanation of what an elliptic curve is. So it's a, a, a curve that is a smooth, projective, and of genus one defined over a field K. In this case, we're looking at elliptic curves over Q, so over Q. And uh, such um, elliptic curve, there is a, a common model we write elliptic curves in, which is the Weierstrass model, which is a, a model of that shape. By the way, here's a trick that I learned that uh, if you highlight that and copy it, uh, typically such a thing is an sort of image that you cannot copy and paste other places, but if you copy that into a text um, editor, then it will actually copy it in a way that I can use it in LaTeX or uh, I can use it in, uh, in Magma. I'll, I'll show a little bit more about uh, Magma and SageMath in a moment, how they connect to the database. And I'll, I'll, I'll work more on that in the follow-up videos uh, on, on Magma and SageMath, how to collect data from the database and use it in my computations. Okay, so uh, by the way, if uh, you want to learn more about elliptic curves, um, one of my previous students, Harris Daniels, and uh, myself, we wrote a, an article for the notices of the AMS on the what is series, what is an elliptic curve, so you can read more about elliptic curves there. Uh, you can also see a series of videos that um, I created for CTNT 2016. There is a series of videos on YouTube about an introduction to elliptic curves. So if you want to learn more about the elliptic curves in particular, uh, you can start in those places if you want, or of course, uh, using uh, standard literature such as Silverman's The Arithmetic of Elliptic Curves. All right, so uh, let's close this and let's look for some uh, elliptic curves. So uh, elliptic curves are organized by their conductor, which um, the conductor is actually a little bit complicated to define, but uh, essentially it tells you what is the arithmetic complexity of the elliptic curve. So let's look for some easy elliptic curves in the database. It gives me a list of elliptic curves, and perhaps the, the uh, easiest elliptic curves in terms of coefficients is this elliptic curve 11A3 in their labeling system, and that is uh, 11A3. They call it the first elliptic curve in nature, perhaps because of the uh, the nice uh, coefficients, the smallness of the coefficients. Um, some highlights of the properties of the elliptic curve are given here. If I uh, if I right click on this uh, graph, then I can get a nicer view of the uh, elliptic curve graph, and um, I have all sorts of other information about the elliptic curve. Uh, elliptic curves are ubiquitous. Uh, they appear in all sorts of uh, scenarios, such as uh, in math and outside of math, in physics and uh, cryptography and computer science. Uh, but in particular, in number theory and algebraic geometry, they appear in many places. And we are, uh, as number theorists, we are interested in the um, rational points on an elliptic curve. And that's called the mordell vey group of the elliptic curve. And uh, the database gives me what are the rational points and what is the structure of this mordell vey group because by the mordell vey theorem, an elliptic curve, the rational points on an elliptic curve form a finitely generated abelian group uh, over a number field, uh, such as Q in this case. But in this case, there is just finitely many points. There are five points on this elliptic curve. And they are actually all these four points here and the point at infinity. So they are described by the database. Uh, it gives me other types of information, such as the J invariant, which is an invariant, a number that classifies the elliptic curve up to, up to isomorphism over Q bar, and uh, gives me information about the endomorphism rank, whether there is complex multiplication or not. Complex multiplication is telling me whether there are extra endomorphisms, so no extra endomorphisms, so there is no CM in this case. And um, something that is of great interest to in number theorists is the Birch and Sinerton Dyer conjecture which relates the vanishing of the ELF function attached to this elliptic curve. By the way, I can go here to the related object. So it turns out I can build an ELF function for this elliptic curve, and this ELF function is related to that elliptic curve. The coefficients that appear in the Dirichlet ELF function, these coefficients are related. So for example, this coefficient minus two is related to some arithmetic of the elliptic curve modulo 7. 
is in it's what's called the trace of Frobenius, and it can be also calculated um, calculating the number of points modulo seven for this elliptic curve. Okay, so uh, this function is attached to that elliptic curve, and the uh, B, your, the BSD, the Birchin Zinnerton Dyer conjecture, tells me that the vanishing at the central point of that L function is equal to the rank of this elliptic curve. The rank being the rank as an algebra as a um, as an infinitely generated abelian group, the rank is zero, so the vanishing of the ideal function should be zero, and it is. And um, more fine information, the BSD predicts that the residue of the L function at uh, S equals one, so if you take the appropriate derivative, the residue has a very special form in terms that can be written in terms of refined invariants of the elliptic curve, which the database lists. By the way, how do you compute all these uh, invariants? Let me close this. I can go to um, magma code. So if I click here, then I can open a window that gives me all the commands in magma that would compute uh, the information that is given by the database. And I can also do it in SageMath, okay, in CodeCalc. So these are the, the same, the commands that would give me all the information that is displayed by the database would be computed with those codes. And I use that code in the future, in future videos about Magma and SageMath, I will use these things just to, to learn how to work with elliptic curves in particular. Okay, um, what else I want to show about elliptic curves. Um, yeah, so there is also a modular form. I'll talk a little bit about modular forms at the end of this video. And it gives me the modular form attached to the elliptic curve, which um, there's a modular form attached to it because of the famous uh, theorem of Wiles and Taylor Wiles um, that was uh, approved of the tiny Yamashimura-Ve conjecture that relates the two worlds of elliptic curves and modular forms. So that function, which I are, by the way, the coefficients are the coefficients that appear in the L function that I showed. So they're computed in the same way. Those uh, coefficients give me a modular form and um, that it appears in somewhere else in the database. We'll go there. Special value is the value that is uh, appears in the BSD conjecture. Local data, it tells me what kind of reduction I have for this elliptic curve at different primes. If it's good, it will not appear here. If it's bad, it will appear unlisted and tell me what kind of reduction I have in those cases. I have uh, also information about the Galois representations. It gives me information about the two attic representation. This is uh, work of um, Rouse and Zurich Brown, where they've classified all the possible two attic representations attached to the elliptic curve with LCM. And then they, it also tells me what happens with the mod p Galois representations. By the way, Galois representations are representations that come from the natural action of Galois on torsion points. And uh, the database gives me a lot of information. For example, it gives me that the mod p Galois representation, the image is all of GL2, fp, except at 5, where the image is a Borel subgroup. You can look at the labels and what the different things mean. So b means Borel. So it's a type of Borel subgroup, the image at five. Gives me some piatic information, some refined Iwasawa invariants, and it also gives me information about the isogenies. The isogenies is also, uh, the isogeny information is also up here. Uh, elliptic curves come in, um, in classes of isogenies, and isogeny is a map between elliptic curves, and this means that all these three classes of 11 the same letter A means they're connected via isogenies. So you can look at the graph of uh, isogenies here, and that means this elliptic curve where I started from has a 5 isogeny to another elliptic curve and a 25 isogeny to another elliptic curve. And these are the ones that are there. It tells you which one is gamma not optimal. Uh, they all share the same modular form, the same L function and it gives you the isogeny matrix, which gives you the degrees of the isogenies uh, from, one from one elliptic curve to the other. Very good. Uh, let's look at some other elliptic curves that are nice. Uh, here they highlight the Gauss elliptic curve. Uh, at the bottom will learn why it's called the Gauss elliptic curve, but I'm interested in this one in particular because it has 
is the smallest conductor elliptic curve of rank 3. So uh, that means that the mordal Vey group is uh, generated by three elements of infinite order. These are the points of infinite order, and it gives you the canonical heights. And this elliptic curve is pretty nice. It has a lot of integral points. These are all the integral points on the elliptic curve. And um, then it gives you the invariance. The conductor is 5077 for this elliptic curve. And um, here is uh, the BSD invariance. So the rank now is 3. The order of vanishing is 3. And therefore, the special value that they give me is the residue at 1. But in this case, I have to compute the third derivative of the L function divided by 3 factorial to get the special value. It's only um, bad at 1 prime. And then uh, this is also pretty special that the duatic representation is surjective, but it's also um, the mod peer representation is always GL2 of FP. Okay, and there are other information about this elliptic curve. And at the very end, there is uh, historical information, and it tells you, uh, you can read this on your own, it tells you why this is called the Gauss elliptic curve, and it's because it was used uh, via Goldfold's method to prove and um, finish um, Gauss's class number problem. Um, using using this elliptic curve, and the key was that the rank is 3 for this elliptic curve. Okay. One other thing that uh, is in the database is that there are elliptic curves over number fields. So now you can browse elliptic curves over other number fields, not just Q. So for example, if you go to Q at join I, you can look for elliptic curves, which are defined natively in Q adjoint I. So these uh, elliptic curves, so this elliptic curve is an elliptic curve that whose Weierstrass equation is definitely defined over Q adjoint I. Uh, the J invariant is 1728 in this case. So this elliptic curve has this model, but actually um, is isomorphic over Q bar than elliptic curve over Q. Um, let's look for an elliptic curve uh, that's quite special uh, to me anyway. So uh, something that doesn't happen over Q is uh, that the conductor cannot be 1. There is always a bad prime, a prime of bad reduction for an elliptic curve over Q, but over number fields the conductor can be 1, elliptic curves that are um, good everywhere. Uh, so thanks to the database we can look through the database for such elliptic curves. So for example, uh, you can uh, now find easily elliptic curves that are good everywhere. So for example, uh, this looks pretty nice. So if you go to this elliptic curve, an elliptic curve with this model where A is a root of this, so A is a square root of 26, um, then this elliptic curve has conductor equal to 1. Uh, so it is good everywhere. There is no primes of bad reduction for this elliptic curve. Okay. All right. So that's that's pretty nice. But you see that some things are not available in this case. So uh, we have not computed the uh, the Mordelve group, or the the database is not yet complete. In that the, some pieces of information are missing. For example, there is no rank available for this elliptic curve yet. Um, Something else that is nice is that, uh, so the graphs now uh, for these elliptic curves, you see there are two different graphs because I can embed uh, Q adjoint the square root of 26, I can embed it into the real, so this is a real locus interpretation of the elliptic curves, and I can embed it in two different ways with the square root of 26 or minus the square root of 26, and that gives me two different uh, graphs. Okay. So that's about elliptic curves. So let's just finish up uh, talking a little bit about modular forms. Let's look at just classical uh, modular forms. So if you don't know what a modular form is, that's uh, a long definition, so I'm not going to get into it. But you can read about it here. Uh, essentially, a modular form is a holomorphic function on the upper half plane, on the upper half uh, complex plane, uh, that satisfy some particular transformation properties, some sort of symmetries that make these uh, function quite special and they have some very interesting um, arithmetic applications. The transformation properties come from um, rational transformations by SL2Z uh, or by subgroups of SL2Z and these uh, modular forms, these functions appear uh, and all of a sudden they are 
uh, related to other things of arithmetic interest, such as, well, elliptic curves and other uh, sort of abelian varieties of higher dimensional varieties. So uh, let's look for some uh, new forms. So uh, new forms, for example, of weight 2, uh, which are the ones that are related, for example, to elliptic curves. So if you look for new forms, you can see the class of 11.2. Um, that class is the modular form that showed up uh, here. So you can see the isogenic class. What is it related to? Is it related to an isogenic class of elliptic curves? And this is the elliptic curve isogeny class that we saw before. So this is another way to get to it. And uh, if you start from um, another modular form, so for example, another form of uh, weight 2 is this one, but in this case, the um, the dimension of the um, of the new form the dimension of a new form refers to the dimension of the new form subspace or the cardinality of its new form orbit. It turns out that uh, this one is defined over q adjunct the square root of minus three. The dimension is two, so that means that the orbit has two elements which correspond to Galois conjugates of this modular form modular modular form and uh, they are here. There is one modular form and another modular form. Uh, these modular forms are also attached to or uh, conjecturally attached to other abelian varieties. So for example, uh, this one is attached to an isogeny class. Let's see where it goes. In this case, it's not attached to an elliptic curve. Elliptic curves are genus 1. This is a genus 2 hyperelliptic curve and the modular form is attached to the uh, Jacobian variety of this hyperelliptic curve. Uh, so now we've gone to this area of the database, genus 2 uh, varieties, and this one we got to coming from a modular form that is here. So let me go back to modular forms. And um, what else can we find about the modular forms? We can, uh, depending on the embedding, these are the real, uh, the two uh, different embeddings. Oh, not real. These are there are two complex embeddings for this field, and um, each one gives me a different modular form. So I can click on it and then just see modular form and see refined information about that modular form in particular, and uh, it gives me more information about the coefficients, a lot of information about the coefficients, about twists, and uh, if you go back, I believe here uh, will also give me information about the Hecke characters and the polynomials, the characteristic polynomials of the Hecke characters on this space. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say. I don't want to make this video uh, way too long, um, but just other things that are here that I haven't talked about. There's a lot more in the database, so feel free to explore it. There is information about not just classical modular forms, but mass forms and Hilbert modular forms, Bianchi forms, and um, higher genus abelian varieties, higher genus uh, varieties, and higher uh, dimensional abelian varieties. There's also information about local fields. And uh, of course, something that is, um, there's a lot of research going on about satotate groups. There is quite a bit of information about satotate groups also. Okay, so uh, that's all. And uh, in follow up videos, what I'll do is talk about magma and uh, SageMath, CoCalc. And uh, I will come back to the database to grab some data and work with uh, um, some of the data from the database to compute other things using those algebra packages. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thank you for watching.